So good to see everybody. Good morning, 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 good morning. Everybody, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. What's up, Casper? I was about to get on my phone. Just saying. I was about to get on the phone. I'm just, you could feel it, couldn't you? Could you? Yeah. I'm going to turn this down so it doesn't feed back onto me. How's that? Is that better? Hello, hello. I don't know. I think I might be doing it the wrong way. Hello, hello. There. Yeah, there we go. Hello. Yeah, that's better. It's good to just see everybody. It's good to see everybody. Uh, been kind of crazy here lately, right? Totally insane. Everyone's lost their ro- off their rocker, right? Off their rocker, off their rocker, off their rocker. Who thinks this is the craziest time in America that's ever been? I have a lot of people in here a little bit older than me, so you've seen some other things, but you think it's the craziest ever? Oh, yeah. Is this the craziest ever? Is it? Is it? I don't know. I'm, all, I'm so young, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he is. All right, let's get into this thing, right? Uh, tell, me what you hear, tell me what you hear right here. Hear the, listen to this, listen to this, listen, 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 listen. Ready? What is that? That's terrible right there. What is that noise you just heard? Screeching tire. Screeching tire. It was a screeching tire, wasn't it? Let's hear it again, but turn it up a little bit. Let's turn it up a little bit. So I don't think everybody got the, the full impact there. Get it? Turn it up. Ready? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Try, trying to find a spot, man. <laughs> trying to find a spot. That's the tire sound, right? Screeching tires, right? That's what it is, but what it is, 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 is a response, right, to a situation. Let's just call it what it really is, right? Someone obviously pulled out in front of this person or whatever, right? And so they had to respond to a situation, and that's what you hear there. And we are always, always having to do just that, right? Stuff comes into our life, and we have to respond to it, right? Personally, we've seen now... We just said it's been crazy. Nationally, right, we've had to respond to something. And then missionally, as a church, right, these things just happen. But like waves of the ocean, bring up them waves. I want you to see the waves. Aren't there some waves on there? Aren't there waves? I, brought, I downloaded a wave picture. It's not in there? Okay, so envision waves, right? So this week, this week I went to the beach with Meredith and the kids. And, and, and we're, sti- we're there, and right, just wave after wave after wave. And I started thinking about that, like, just like stuff that comes into our life, these waves just keep coming. They just keep coming. They never cease, right? And so are the circumstances and situations of life. They just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. And I wish that I could tell you that you kind of outgrow all that, right? Remember when you were a kid, when you were like, 10, 12 years old, everything's totally fine, you're enjoying being a kid, and then you turn like 13 and you get a pimple. And you're like, oh man, this isn't so bad. By the time you're 13 and a half, you look, you're covered, right? You're like, man, this is awful. It just happens, but then you get, you get through it, right? And so by the time you get to like 17, 18, 19, right, they start to go away. You just outgrow that, that situation in your life, right? And I wish you could say that that was the case with trouble, with circumstances and situations in life, you know, now that I'm in my 50s, I wish I could just tell you that you just kind of outgrow stuff, that stuff doesn't adversely affect me anymore because now I'm 51. But that would be a lie, right? Can someone say amen? amen? That would be a lie. It just doesn't happen that way. They just keep coming, keep coming. The ocean waves of life never, ever stop. And the latest wave that we've got in our life that's crashed upon the shore of God's people and everybody is this new wave, and it's called COVID-19, and it's dominating our lives right now. I would say it's not a small wave at all. I would say that it's substantial. I'm not ready to call it a tidal wave just yet, but it is big, and it's a problem, and we have to deal with it. Okay, but here's the problem with the problem. The problem with the problem is that the problem is now dictating how we, as Christians, are living our lives. 
Okay, and, and, and not just that, but as individuals, as a nation, but most importantly, as a church. Not just revolution, but as a universal church, as the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones who are living in the world but are not supposed to be of the world, the ones who are supposed to be different. We're the body of Christ. And this latest wave is dictating and shaping how we live our lives. And that's wrong. Now, there's two things that I, I'm going to, this is not going to be like, wow, that guy's brilliant, right, at all. He's going to be like, yeah, I knew that. And I guess I knew this, too, but I didn't realize it till this weekend. So I'm standing there, and I'm watching the ocean waves, right? And I realize there's something true about every ocean wave. Every ocean wave has two things in common. Do you know what they are? Every, listen, so there's that. I had it worded, worded a little bit differently. Here's, my, here's what I saw. Every single wave has one before it, and every single wave has one after it. And we're sitting there on Daytona Beach, and, 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 and every two, three seconds, for all three days, and it never, ever stopped. And each one that came had one before it, and each one that came has one after it. It never, ever, ever stops. And we as a people, not just individually, not as a nation, but as a world, we've had some massive waves that have come into our life. They've rolled into our life, and there's been endless waves that could impact our lives. And I could go through a list that would take hours and days to list these massive waves that have hit. I just grabbed a few out, just want to remind you of a few of these. None of you are, I'm sure, old enough to remember World War I. 1914 through 1918 was a wave that crashed upon the shore of every person on this earth, and 16 million people lost their lives in that war. 16 million now, if that's not enough, when that wave rolled back out, another one came right behind it called the Spanish flu. Right behind it. And the la when the war ended in 1918, you couldn't even exhale, and boom, Spanish flu hits. Listen, 50 million people worldwide died. 50 million. And of that number, 675,000 of them we're here in the States. Fast forward the, the, the calendar just this much, and you find yourself right out of World War I into World War II. 1939 to 1945 wasn't too long ago. Listen, another 50 million people ceased from that war. Fast forward a little bit more to something we were all here for. Well, everyone except one. <laughs> 2001, September 11th, day that will never be forgotten. The, the terrorists grab these planes. They go through the buildings. They devastate one of our major cities. They kill 3,000 of us. It was a massive wave that hit our nation. And the economy took a massive hit, too. And then it started to, to, to resolve itself. But then, boom, 2007, 2008, 2009 hits, and our economy just plummets, right? And all these people that had worked their whole life to save up and have a pension, they worked at General Motors, General Electric, whatever, and they saved up. They worked their whole lives to have a pension. And all of a sudden, they wake up one morning, and that pension is gone, their 401k plan that they had all their money invested into the market, gone, non-existent. Their house is foreclosed. Their car is repossessed. Massive, massive wave that hit our country. Those are universal things that affect all of us, but we all have our own personal waves too, right? I mean, I had one, like, I don't even know how long ago it was, 11, 12 years ago. All of a sudden, I come home, my ex-wife, gone takes half of my stuff, takes my kid, decides, you know what, I'm going to go live with my boyfriend, my atheist boyfriend now. I mean, that's a, that's a, world, I mean, that's a world changer, right? And, and so listen, that was, my, that, that was a personal wave in my life. Maybe you didn't have that in your life, but maybe you had something. Maybe you had a, a loss of a career, your company folded. Maybe there was a divorce. 
Maybe there was bankruptcy. Maybe you had a, a kid go sideways on you. Maybe there was a, a massive illness that you had. Maybe you, had, you experienced profound loss as you lost your mother or your father. And some people, man, it just seems like they lose mom, dad, cousin, friend, all in like three months, right? Like, wow, boom. Wave after wave after wave after wave, they just keep coming. And it's in times like this, in great circumstance, where God's people have to make choices. How should we respond to the wave that crashes upon our shore? Well, I want to help you with that this morning, okay? I mentioned a bunch of these waves that came through our lives, right, from the Spanish flu, right? Listen, when the Spanish flu came and went... This didn't change. Amen. When World War I and World War II came and went, this didn't change. When the planes went through the buildings and the economy crashed, this didn't change. When my ex-wife left, this didn't change. I don't know what, what problem you had in your life, but this never changed. And when COVID-19 showed up, listen up, loved ones. This still has not changed. Amen. The word of God is the anchor that holds your life when the waves crash on your shore. And you have to hold on to this unchanging word, okay? So listen, you can't, this is what's happening. You can't say, yeah, this, this is the fullness of Christian faith. This explains the whole thing. And it was awesome. But now, listen, guys, you've got a brain that God gave you. You should use it for reason. Figure stuff out. Like that was then and this is now. Things have changed. That's not the way that it works, okay? All of this, why am I saying all this right now? I'm usually not a topical guy. I'm usually not drawing things out of the news, but I didn't completely do that. All of this is coming because I had a crash in my life, and it wasn't a car crash on the way to the beach. It was a crash between the response to COVID-19 by the church. I'm talking about Christ followers and the leaders of the Christ followers. That response across our nation Versus Acts chapter 13, which is where we're supposed to be this morning. And I read Acts chapter 13, and I see what's going on. And, and all of a sudden, afresh, I start going, what are we thinking? What are we thinking here? Like, why are we doing what we're doing? So let's read Acts chapter 13 and, and see if maybe you see what I see. Okay, are you guys ready to... Jump back into Acts for two things, right? Truth shared and examples shown, Amen. right? In the unchanging word of God, right? Which was valid at the end of 2019 before we heard anything about this and will be valid until the day he cuts open the clouds, right? Nothing changes. So let's see this morning what we can obey. Are you guys in for that? Yes. Okay, let's read Acts chapter 13, just the first three verses. It's all I needed, man. Three verses. So among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaen, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and praying, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this probably next week in a different way, like what it's actually practically teaching there about sending people doing this doing that everyone has their own role was the church commanded to advance itself advance the church advance the church wasn't that what we've been commanded yes. weren't they commanded that okay was there a good reason for them to stop doing that yes, yes. right they could have gotten killed for it right so, so listen, we need to just stop and, and just look at things for what they are. There's always going to be reasons to stop doing what God has ordered you to do. Can we all agree to that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And some might think the, the excuse or the reason is valid and some may not, but there's always going to be reason to stop, to halt what God says to do. So this, this, this just so much insane. It, there's so much in these three verses, it's crazy. Let me ask you a question. What were these people doing? Okay. 
perfect, okay? First things first, though, gathering. Did you see it? They were together, right? This wasn't at, sitting at home in your prayer closet. They were gathering, they were worshiping, and they were fasting, okay? Listen, loved ones, I'm going to like... I'm going to show you the high bar. When Jesus said that the the gate is narrow and the road is difficult, it wasn't because he had nothing left to say. It's because it's real. This stuff in here is not so you can go, wow, those guys were amazing. We should be gathering. We should be fasting. We should be worshiping. That's why it's in there, right? Can we all agree? Okay. So now here's the second thing. When did this happen? When, was, when were they doing this? Yeah, what day was that? Here's the thing. That's a great assumption, but listen, listen. So the author of this book is Luke, right? So we know that, that Luke wrote Luke. That's a no-brainer. And we also know that he wrote this book. So Luke is not afraid to say when it was on the Sabbath that it's the Sabbath, right? In Acts chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 13, verse 10, he tells a story about Jesus, and he starts it out with this, one Sabbath day. And again, in, in Luke chapter 14, verse 1, it says the same thing, one Sabbath day. So Luke is not afraid to call it the Sabbath day when it's the Sabbath day. Can you agree to that? Yes. And does he say it here? No, he does not. So I'm just thinking, and I don't know for sure, but I'm just thinking that's probably not the Sabbath. What it is is one day, and the same kind of language happens in Acts chapter 3. If we just pause on 13 and go back to 3.1, it says that Peter and John went up to the temple together. They went to a building together, right, at the hour of prayer. Do you know what time the hour of prayer was? Three. They went at 3, yeah, afternoon, 3 o'clock. Were they, are they praying alone or are they praying together? together? They prayed together. That's a pitch right there for Monday night. I, no, I'm serious. Like, I, you know, I don't beat around the bush, right? So I don't know how to. Why do we gather up on Monday night? I don't know, maybe because of this, maybe because that's what, followers of Christ are supposed to do to gather together for a prayer they didn't go on just the Sabbath day like it, so you're saying Christians are supposed to go to church more than on Sunday morning at 10 but right? they're supposed to go on this day and that day and then at three o'clock in the afternoon holy moly I can't believe that they went all online right now you know I'm, I'm pushing our church like left and right and I'm getting Christian after Christian I think saying, you don't have to go to church to worship God. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Okay, I get all that. But can you guys do me a favor? Aren't we supposed to be like Jesus? Yeah. Are we supposed to come up with our own hybrid Christianity? Just make some stuff up. Sounds Christian-y. Pick up a verse out of here, a verse out of there. Aren't we supposed to be like Jesus? Yeah. Okay, so do me a favor. Open up your Bible to Luke 21. I want you to see this with your own eyes. Luke 21, two verses, 37 and 38. Just want you to see these words, because this would be a tough one for me to sell on my own. You've got to see it with your own eyes. And if you're watching online, I'm happy that you're here. And I would like for you to open up your Bible to Luke chapter 21. And I want you to read this for yourself. Luke 21, 37 and 38. I'm going to read it out loud. Every day Jesus went to the temple to teach. And each evening he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. And the crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him. How often does Jesus go to church? Every single day. How often did the people, the crowds of people gather in the church to hear him preach? Every day. How many days a week did he leave the temple, because let's give that props too, and go by himself on some spot and pray to the Father alone? Every day. It's not one or the other, it's both. 
There's no false dichotomy that somehow is being formed in the church, that it's either one or the other. It's both. I'm so tired of, you don't have to go to church, you don't have to go to church. Listen, in this matter of gathering, we see in our text in Acts chapter 13, we see that the Holy Spirit spoke to the followers of Christ in the context of the gathered church. Listen, if, if nothing else, this is a heavenly endorsement of the gathering, a sanctioning of, by the Holy Spirit of the validity and the importance of the gathering. It is not to be neglected. If it was to be neglected, why would the Holy Spirit show up there in that context and speak to his people? If he wanted them at home, if he wanted them just in their tree stand or just in their boat or just wherever, but not in the gathering, why would the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, show up and speak to those people in the gathering? Because he wants it. Because he wants it. And the COVID response of slamming on the brakes nationally, it doesn't apply to the ecclesia, to the called out ones, who according to Romans 12, 2 says, we're not supposed to copy the behaviors and customs of this world. That's what it says in the Bible. Can we all just do this right now, right? Before I say another thing. Can we all, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Raise your hand if you're a Christian. I mean legit, legit, right? Okay, so is this the word of God? Yes. Is this the truth? Is this the only outline, sola scriptura? That means it's the only truth that defines our Christianity. This is it, right? Nowhere else. No apocrypha, no pope, no Moses, no nothing. Right here. Do you agree? Raise your hand if you agree. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Because if you don't have that, you can't move on. You can't move on. We are supposed to do as the Bible says. Nothing else is Christianity. Will you fail? Raise your hand again. Oh, yeah. That's where grace kicks in. I get it, right? No one's perfect. All of us fail in many ways. And Jesus knows your heart. He understands your failure. Go to him in repentance and faith and ask for another chance. He'll give it to you, right? But we are supposed to go into our everyday knowing that this defines Christianity. Not me, not you, not anyone else. Only this. Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone, that's what that means, okay? The Bible alone, and that's why we spend so much time in it here, in our church, because it's supposed to define who we are and what we do, not our own opinions, okay? So listen, there's a little history lesson, did a little study this week. So you guys understand that Rome, like there's a lot of things involved with Jesus' death, like he already planned it, he was willing to do it, he was going to do it, no one could stop it, Right? It was the Jewish people that accused him, so they helped him that too, right? And it was the Roman people who actually did the, right? So there was lots of people involved. Okay, Rome actually killed Jesus, like physical, the physical death. You guys understand that, right? The spikes, the hammer, the cross, all that, right? But did you know that, that, that Rome killed Jesus, but shortly thereafter, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Like, that's a mind blow, right? So I did a little research. So here, here's the deal. Here's how this happens. So during the Roman Empire, there were, so obviously our world is a lot bigger now. Like, they didn't even know we were doing stuff in other parts of the world when Rome's going on. But in their world, they had, they had some sickness and disease break out as well. So they had some, uh, to, to them it was a pandemic. So they had this massive sickness, disease. They didn't have hospitals and doctors like we have now, you know, that can really help. They had nothing like that now. So when people are, when there's a sickness, like people are really dying like crazy, you know what I mean? So, so they would quarantine people because they were sick in, in Rome. The Roman Empire would say, well, if you're sick, you, you have to stay in. But here's the difference between then and now. Okay? Then the Christians were earnestly seeking out the sick. The Gentile sick to minister to them physically and spiritually. They would go to them. They would intentionally, not only were they gathering still, they never quit gathering, but they also pursued the sick non-believers to, to feed them, to share the gospel with them, and to bathe them. Listen, and it helped a lot, but certainly a lot of people died. And listen, here's the deal. Many of the Christians ended up burying their own. 
And why did they do this? Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because even though we die, we live. And that's the truth of God's word. Is it a wonder why Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire? Of course not. But nowadays, we've got a sickness and churches are closing and buying into some stupid lie that we could just have church on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Listen, we're doing Facebook Live. But that's not to substitute this. It's for those that are legit. Like I have a Scott Bleege. I love him. He's probably watching right now. He can't walk. Right? If you're in a hospital bed and you cannot get up, if you're bed bound, if you're out of town on business, tune in. But not to separate, not to substitute, I should say, this. This is, listen, that stuff online, that's a service. That's one of the biggest travesties, I think. It's been changed. The Bible never called for a service. Did you know that? A service is when someone serves, right? So that stuff that's online right now, that that's the church, that's one dude in his skinny jeans serving everybody else. But that's not what the Bible calls for. The Bible calls for a gathering, right? That's what it's supposed to be. As each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. How are you supposed to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to each other if you're at your house and I'm at mine? How am I supposed to lay hands on the sick and and ask for healing if they're at home and I'm at the church? How are we supposed to break bread together? We have to have lunch from now on. That that convicted me yesterday. There's no reason to bail out of that, right? How are we supposed to break bread together if you're at your house and I'm at mine? How are we supposed to to praise together if you're at your house and I'm at mine? I have 15, right now as we sit here... Meredith and I have 1,501 friends on Facebook. I don't even know a third of them. So don't say that Facebook is together. It's not together. This is together. We are together this morning, and that's what God has ordained from, for thousands of years, it's always been God's people gathering together to worship and pray to him. That's what he's always ordained, and we have just backed away from that like crazy. Acts chapter 2, it, it shows it in detail. They gathered daily in the temple. And they gathered daily in people's homes. Not one or the other, but what? Both. Don't be a church building only person. Don't be a church at home only person. Be a Bible person that says it's both. They gathered together daily in the temple and in homes. They shared everything they had. They shared their money. They shared their time. They shared their meals. They prayed together. They praised together. And that's why the author of Hebrews in chapter 10 says, do not forsake this. But here comes our newest wave called COVID-19. And just like this, the church forsakes that. Just like that. We forsake a command of God. It's just plucked right out of the Bible and set aside as if his commands are disposable. I hate it. We let this momentary, temporary circumstance decide for us to negate a timeless command of God. But this one thing, this this COVID-19 is just evidence of a greater problem. This wholesale disregard for this one facet of our faith right here, the gathering, is just an indicator of a much bigger problem. Here's the problem. The problem is this. So everyone's talking about that, that, that normal's gone, right? That there's no more normal, right? We're going to have a new normal. Did you guys hear this? Yep. Right? It, it, what, what's the new normal everyone's talking about? What's the new normal for you personally? What's the new normal for our nation? What's the new normal for the ecclesia, the church of Jesus Christ? What's the new normal? We've got to figure out what the new normal is for the church. What's the new thing that God is doing? We've got to jump on board with that thing. Many people in the church are looking for this new form of church. Like, what do we got to do? Social media, we've got all these things that God's provided for us. Social media and, and technology platforms and how do we reach this culture now because we got social distancing and crowd limits and all that? Listen up, loved ones. Look at me. 
We don't need a new form. We need a reform. We need a reformation back to what's supposed to be, right? We don't need to be asking God, what's, it's our fault. We talked, Carl and I, it's, it's probably my fault. I'll take the blame. We talk, when we prayed the other, a couple weeks ago, we talked, what's the new city on the hill look like? <laughs> wrong, 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 wrong. Let me tell you, okay? In 1517, there was a guy named Martin Luther. He was a, a Roman Catholic priest monk. He lived in a monastery, you know, just a couple other monks that just hung out by themselves. I'll tell you something. And, and, and so he was, he, was, he was big on the Roman Catholic Church. Let me just tell you what, how this all happens, history, okay? Jesus Christ died, buried, resurrected. Pentecost, church starts, right? No denominations, no divisions in the church, just people following the way, right? That's what happened. And, and so time goes on, and of course people have their own autonomy, they have their own opinions of what should be, instead of just going, what, what God says. And so all of a sudden, different groups form. And so here comes the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm not here to judge the Roman Catholic Church. I'm sure there's plenty of people in Roman Catholicism that love Jesus. That's their deal, not mine. I don't know. And I don't even go to a Roman Catholic Church nor study it, so I don't know. I'm not going to pass judgment on that. But in 1517, there's this guy, Martin Luther, who's, who's actively involved as a leader in the Roman Catholic Church. And he realizes after he's spending time as a, as a good priest, right, a pastor, or whatever, should, he should, what should they be doing? Reading this, right? They should be studying this. And he realizes after careful study that, the, that what the Roman Catholic Church believes and what they're practicing and what they're teaching doesn't line up with this. And they're like, he's, so what he does is he takes a piece of paper and he jots down these 99 things that he sees that the Roman Catholic Church does that are not according to what the scripture, what the word of God says to do. And he goes out to this church in Germany, takes a little hammer and nails, and he tacks it to the front door of the church. And so starts the Protestant Reformation. This is people protesting, Protestant, protesting what the, the Roman Catholic Church is now doing. Not that they're bad people. I have no idea what their intentions of their heart are, so we don't judge that. But their practices are not right. So a bunch of people buy into what he's saying. They start to protest what the church is doing. And they didn't come up with something new. The Reformation wasn't to come up with something new. It was to re reform the church back to what God had ordained in his word, right? That's what happened in the Reformation. And they, we don't need, like, they didn't need to reinvent the wheel, right? God's wheel is God's word, and it rolls perfectly. It doesn't need help. And that's what we need because the church is now just doing stuff that is not what the Bible says to do. So we don't need to come up with a new church. We need to find what the real church is and do that. Okay, that's it. That's it. So, Christ's church advancing is what the book of Acts is all about, right? It's all about supernatural signs and wonders and gifts and all that. But at the end of the day, you melt it all down, what is it? It's the story of God's people responding to who Jesus is and what he said in his commission and what he said in Acts 1a, go be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, and this is how you're supposed to respond to it. That's what we see. And are we to think that, hey, you know what? The way we did church was great back then in how it advanced the kingdom of God, but now we have corona. So we're supposed to change that. And now, you know, for that matter, any modern cultural pressure that comes our way, we're supposed to change it? Look for a new form? Don't have to worry about this anymore. Let's figure out a new way to do church. At the core of our faith are two things. The inerrancy of Scripture, which means that it is perfect as it is and true. And the sufficiency of Scripture, which means it is enough. And that's why the Bible says, do not go beyond what is written. That is at the foundation of Christianity. And any other Christianity that goes beyond what the Word of God says is not 
Christianity. It might be good moral behavior. It may be being nice to grandmas. But it is not Christianity. Christianity is laid out perfectly and clearly right here. That's why we study it intensely here at our church. But you hear it all the time. Well, that was then. And this is now. And things are different. And we got all this COVID and people are going to die. And, and I know they're going to die. Guess what? Here's the good news at church. So are you. You're going to die too. And I'm going to die too. And I don't know when that day comes. It might be I might live till I'm 100 or I might get whacked by a bus as soon as I leave this parking lot today. I might get COVID. I might not. But to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I get to be here, I get to spread the news of Christ. If I get to die, I get to be with them. Um, it's a win-win, right? But we don't have that mentality anymore. Christianity has become protect everybody so no one gets sick. How many people in here have read the Bible? Is God more concerned with your illness right now or your eternal security? If forever, he wants you in his kingdom, man. That's what he wants. He wants you in his kingdom so when the day comes that you do get whacked, you're his. Let's just call it what it is, man. Things are different now. I can't gather because they have cooties. I got this everyday thing and, and I'm gathering all the time and in the temple and coming and then in my home. I can't, I can't do that. And I got to take my kids to soccer. I got to take my son to travel ball. I've got to, I got to watch football on Sunday. And Sunday I work all week. I got to work. And, and Sunday's my only day to, to sleep in. And I got a honeydew list. And I could take my daughter to gymnastics. And my buddy asked me to go fishing. And as if biblical culture didn't include work and kids. Oh, and this, farming. How many people are farmers in here or shepherds in here? If we get in our car and we go to work at some store or restaurant or here or, or at an office or in a construction site and we drive in our air conditioning car, we work for eight hours, we come home. The farmer does eight hours before lunch. Right? And they still found a way somehow to, to leave their donkey behind and go to church at three o'clock on some day because it was important. But we can't do that now. We can't do that now. We're way too busy for that. So the autonomous thinking of today's Christian says, nah, you don't got to go to church to, be, to worship God. You don't have to go to church to worship God. Here at all time. And I would just say, yes, you're right. You don't have to go to, to church to worship God. But really what that statement is, let's just call it what it is. It's an excuse and a rationale for not gathering because something's more important to you. It's kind of like a, a, a it's not even a word, but it's a Christian-y half-truth. Because worship isn't exclusive to the house of God. But the house of God shouldn't be excluded from worship. That's the problem. Everyone in our world, do, do, just ever notice that? We, need to fo we form these false dichotomies. Like, so, so, so you're either a Calvinist or you're an Armenian, but you're not, there's nothing in the middle. You can't be. You can't be a Christian if you're not one of us. You have to believe that the gifts continue. I'm a continuationist. Or I'm a cessationist. The gifts have stopped. You can't be one of the, you got to be one or the other. You can't be, right? You're charismatic over there. You're speaking in tongues and everyone's falling over like crazy. So you know what? In response to that, we're going to start a Baptist church over here where we don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. This is what we do. This is what we do. You're either having church in the building or you're having it at home and by yourself. It's not one or the other. I mean, it's one or the other. It can't be both. We draw these like lines in the sand. It's got to be this or it's got to be that. You're either a Methodist or you're not saved. I said this so many times. It's so true. The Apostle Paul got sucked up to the third heaven, whatever that is. God used him to speak the words of God. And in Romans 11, he throws his hands up in the air and says, who can understand the thoughts of God? The guy who understands the thoughts of God says, I don't even understand the thoughts of God. So quit drawing a line in the sand going, it's got to be this. It doesn't have to be that. It, can't be, it, can be, it can be both, right? It can be both. 
at the end of the day, our task, nobody wants to hear about a job in church. We want to hear about grace and love and forgiveness, and it's all that, and that's who God is. But we have a job to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that God has given us the task of reconciling people back to him. That's your job, right? That's why you breathe, is to reconcile people back to him. So our task and purpose is to advance Christ's kingdom by the unchanging word of Christ. You, you, no one gets to, to decide, we're going to, I like this, and I like that, and I take this part out, and I have to do this part, and I just have to be good, and i got to give my tithes. And No, 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 no. We advance God's kingdom by obeying God's word, and it never changes. That's our job. Say, that's my job. I don't know if everybody said it. Dare I say, and I'm going to do it? Yeah, yeah, well, maybe. There's an honest answer in church, finally, right? Now you're going to do it? Going to try. Okay, I'm your pastor. Try harder. Let's just do that, right? Let's try harder. So let's just bring this down to, to home, like close, closer. We're talking, we're talking worldwide. We're talking nationwide. Let's just talk Revolution Church. You're here, God placed you here. His spirit drew you here. God places us together perfectly, and as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. The whole church is healthy, growing, full of love. Ephesians 4, that's what it says. You're here because God put you here. Not because you like it, not because it's convenient, not because it's the service time that's good for you, not because you live close. They don't live close at all. You're here because God called you here. So what is this revolution church? What is Revolution means a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. You know the status quo is? Do whatever you want. The status quo right now, right now, is church at home, church on your couch, church on the couch, pajamas on, coffee in your, on your lap, phone in your hand, watching a dude give a Bible lesson. And I think that we should use technology. We do it here. I don't think there's anything wrong with giving a Bible lesson, but never to substitute the gathering, right? Never. What's that? Yeah, you can wear your pajamas here. It's totally cool. Wear your pajamas. <clears throat> that's the status quo in our country. Okay? That's the status quo in the country. The sudden and momentous shift in the status quo for us is not to get ahead of the curve and figure out the new formation of the church. It's a reformation back to sound biblical teaching and practice. Waves come and go and come and go and come and go, but the word and the way never, ever come and go. You know, the Bible says that when, when all these things come and go, Isaiah says that, 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 that uh, the grass will wither and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. And in the New Testament, Jesus in Matthew 24 said, reiterates the same thing. Just in case you're a New Testament or an Old Testament person, right? He reiterates, he says, that the, that the words of God, like, I'm sorry, that, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Nothing changes, okay? Nothing changes. And so we're not here to, to, to get ahead of the curve and figure out a new formation. We're supposed to reform back to what we're supposed to do. And, and instead of looking for reasons to, to, to slack and do a little bit less and still get away with it and slide into heaven, right? Do I really need to tithe? Do I really need to go? Do I really need to tell the truth all the time? Do I really have to serve? I mean, like, all the time we got to gather and share everything? Yeah, all that. I mean, could, listen. Isn't that what the Bible says? We all, you all agree that the Bible contains the fullness of what your Christianity is supposed to be. And in the Bible, that's what it says. So yes to all those things, Right? The Bible doesn't need a, a, a revision. It doesn't need an appendix at the back that says how to in COVID-19. Because listen, COVID-19 has come and COVID-19 shall go and the word of God will last forever. So what would you set your hopes on? What would you, if you want all things to work out for the good... Not only do you got to love him, but you got to be called to his purpose. 
That doesn't mean all things are going to work out good if you just, if you cave to COVID-19 and hunker down in your house. That's not what we're supposed to do. So who we are, this sudden and momentous shift in the status quo, let's, let me tell you what we are. Bring up that next slide. That's who we are right there. This is our little mission statement, identification mark, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Everyone talks about having a mission statement, a vision statement, whatever. This is who we are. This is who we've always been. It's on all of our print work. It's on our website. It's on our Facebook. This is who we are. We are, in response to, to who Jesus is and what the Bible says to do, not responding to COVID-19, not responding to the president or the governor or whatever it is, whether you like him or not, whether he's doing a great job or not, doesn't matter. Our response as a people, as a church, is in response to who Jesus Christ is and what he has said to do as outlined in his word. We are a, you should know this by heart. When someone asks you, tell me about your church, you should be able to say we are a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. And you should know what that means. What that means is that the reason why we are together, just talked about it a minute ago in Ephesians 4, the gospel of Jesus Christ saved us and gathered us. Would you agree to that? Is there any other reason why you're here? The gospel of Jesus Christ saved you. That's what we have in common, and that's what brought us together. We are here because of the gospel. Would you agree? Amen. And therefore, to be, to be gospel-centered means not only are we here because of the gospel, but we are here for the gospel. We are, we've been saved by the gospel, right? We've been gathered because of the gospel, and our sole purpose is to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what gospel-centered means. No, listen, if you have a great idea for ministry, God bless you. This is what we're doing at this church, and that's it, okay? We are here because of the gospel and for the gospel, and that's it. I don't care if there's one person here or a thousand, that's what we do, and it's unchanging. Because that's been the unchanging task of the Christ followers since the church began. This is what he said to do, right? That's what he said to do. Let's move on. A gospel centered here, because of the gospel and for the gospel, a culture creating community. See that word community? What does that assume? Together. Together. We've been brought together. We're together. Why are we together? We're together, like you are today, to learn a new way of living. That's what culture is, right? Isn't culture the way of life? Your way of life. We are a group of people. They've been brought together to learn a new way of life. Point to the new way of life. Where, do you, where are we finding that? Right here, right? Not out of my mouth, out of this book. We're here to learn together a new way of life, and then, because of the gospel, for the gospel, learning a new way of life together, and then bringing beauty to the world. So we are brought together because of the gospel. We learn together in God's word a new way of living and then we are sent out into this world so we can live the way we've learned and share this way with other people so they can live this way. We are called to influence the world, not to be influenced by the world. Do you understand? There's a massive difference. And we're too influenced by the world. As soon as the world says, hey, don't gather, okay, what, what, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I think, I'm not sure, like, I, this might make you hate me or not come here anymore. I hope you're not that shallow. But I'm going to vote for Donald Trump again. That's just me. Okay, no, 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 we don't clap for him. This is Jesus' place, I'm just telling you, right? I'm going to vote for him. And he said, I think he does a good job. He said not to gather, right? I don't care. Because not all authority in heaven and earth isn't his. Right? All, all authority in heaven and earth belongs to who? Jesus. And he said, go make disciples. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not stopping that. I'm never stopping that. Okay? Until I'm dead, that's what I'm going to do. I don't care what anybody says because he said to go do it. Right? He's the boss. So I listen to him. So we're, listen, we are never, ever to compromise this due to cultural pressure, governmental authority. Listen, I think I might have said this. I have one of my amazing spiritual gifts is I forget everything I've ever said. 
So if I said this last week, please forgive me, but Romans 13, Romans 13. I see it online. They're shredding us all the time. We're supposed to obey the law. We're supposed to obey the law. Yeah, I get it. Did the apostles? Amen. Did Moses obey Pharaoh? Right. Did, did Daniel obey the king? No. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego obey the king? No. Why not? Whoa, 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 whoa. God has ordained government. We're supposed to follow him. Yeah, until they tell you, and they're imperfect people just like you and I. We're Christians, right? Does that mean you always make the right decision? No. no. So a politician is the same thing. They're just people. They're trying to do the best they can, but don't they make mistakes? Yeah. Of course. So when God's, when, when God's men and women, the people in government, make a mistake, are we supposed to go, okay? Yeah. No, we have the Bible right in front of us, and Jesus said, go do this. So we do it. When the government starts to infringe upon what God has told you to do, you stand up. And you say, enough is enough, I'm done, I'm following what Jesus said. He has all authority in, in heaven and earth, you don't. Right. And that's what we do. And if you get arrested, yeah. get arrested. If I get arrested, Joseph said he'll bail me out, so I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. You know, yeah, Herb's going to share, that's a good elder right there. He's going to share in his cell with me. I'm not trying to be flippant, I'm not trying to to stir anything up. I'm just saying, like, we're Christians. And we're not supposed to let anything else dictate and shape our lives other than sola scriptura. This alone dictates and shapes your life. Now, we say that that's true, but will we live that out? The word of God stands true through time and territory. It doesn't make any difference what nation you live in or what year it is right so if god has ordained government and placed them there would you all agree that he does that it says it in romans 13 so you should say yes okay so does that mean that our president and our congress are ordained of god whether you hate them or not right because because it doesn't matter how you think or feel god's word's true okay is the word of god written to every nation tribe and tongue okay so does that mean the nation the the, the government in china is also ordained of god it is. Have they said that Christianity is illegal? Yes. yes. Have they said having a Bible is illegal? Yes. yes. Have they said gathering in Christian church is illegal? Yes. Should Christians say yes to that? No. Hell no. Never. Right? Because Jesus is the boss, not the prime minister of China or whoever he is. You obey God, not man, all the time. And Christians need to start doing this. See, let's, this is a great problem in our, in our country is that we're just picking and choosing and, and laying over like sheep instead of standing up for what we know is true. <coughs> and it's high time that churches stand up and take notice that the world is trying and oftentimes succeeding in stripping away little bits and pieces of our faith. And we're saying that it's okay. And every single thing that they take away, whether it be little or a lot, is like a hatchet to the base of our faith. Amen. I was going to say this for last, but listen. You guys understand that the church in Europe is like dead, yep. right? So in our country, like three to 4,000 churches close every year, Right? We did a study here called Vertical Church, and that's how it all started. That every single year in America, this Christian nation, three to 4,000 churches, just like this one, close. That doesn't mean they've moved across town. That means doors are locked, you know, boards on the window for sale sign out front, done, gone. And what started out, every single church starts the same, right? Some dude's on fire for the Lord. He starts preaching. People gather. And then all of a sudden, something happens, right? And it's not like that anymore. So, so all across Europe is just, it's, it's pockmarked with all these massive churches, buildings, massive cathedrals. And just, I've, I'm, not, I'm not there. I've never visited them. But you could just, you know, who builds a massive cathedral if they don't have any people, right? You got pe so you can envision there was a time, right? There was a time when the place was just packed out with people and there was that man of God up there pounding that pulpit, preaching the word of God. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized, right? It's awesome, right? And now they're empty. And the church of Jesus Christ in Europe is anemic at best, 
a bleep on the heart monitor at best, barely hanging on to life. Why? Was it because the church leaders all got together one day and made a decision? We're not doing this anymore. And they went on TV and said, all right, church, we're done. I have a feeling it didn't go down that way. I have a feeling that it went down like it's going down right here. That day after day, week after week, month and year after year, one more thing, gone. I was going to bring my kids game. I should have brought it. It's called Yeti and my spaghetti. Did you ever see that game? There's a bowl with spaghetti strands, plastic spaghetti, and there's a little snow monster, a Yeti, sitting on the top. And you pull one out, and you pull one out, and you take turns, kind of like Jenga, and eventually you pull that last one, and down goes the Yeti. And it's like that in our church. And heaven help us, it's like that in this church. Let's fight against that. But it's like that in America. Just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Take a little bit of this out. Take a little bit of that out. And eventually, we would be like Europe. Where churches that used to be thriving centers of hope and faith and blessing to a community, that they're either closed or you walk in and you wouldn't even know they had anything to do with Jesus. That they're not just a church with a coffee shop outreach, but they're now a coffee shop. Or a strip club or a casino, or a bookstore. What happened here? A little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. I remember some of you are older than I, but you remember there was a time in America where you put on the TV and it was good, clean stuff, you know? And then all of a sudden, one day, Elvis got on, on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he shook his pelvis. And people went, oh my goodness, did he just do that? It, it was a mind blow. And instead of people rebelling against that, I'm not some prude that says that's bad, but I'm just saying, instead of rebelling against that and saying, you know what, that's just not the way it should be, it was accepted and accepted and accepted and accepted more and more and more and more. And now, if you put on NBC, CBS, primetime, you see cuss word, right? Don't you? All the time. Just a little, just one shake of the, of the pelvis at a time, and all of a sudden you're in the ditch. And that's exactly what's happening in our church. And so I'm just saying, I think, and this is a call to all preachers, all leaders in the church. I think it's time for preachers to stop dumbing it down. I think it's time to, for preachers to stop cutting the corners and making it easy. Because it's not easy. Christianity is a very high bar. It's not a faith of convenience. Jesus said to this one dude who said, how do, I, how do I inherit eternal life? Oh, you need to keep all of God's commands and then sell everything you have and give it to someone else. We decided we're going to give it to Jerome. I mean, that's what he said, right? And, and when the guy said... I can't do that. Walked away. Did Jesus go after him, lower the bar? No. He also said, listen, you have to hate your mother, your, your father, your sons, your daughters, your, your friends, well, everybody compared to how much you love me. Oh, but, 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 but my dad just died. I got to go bury him before I follow you. No, let the dead bury the dead. Let me just go say goodbye to my family. No, your duty is to go preach the kingdom of God and to be a follower of Christ is to bring persecution and suffering and gathering all the time and to pray endlessly and to give generously and to invite every single person. And do, do I really need to do all that? Yeah. No, just sit at home and watch a guy on your phone for 45 minutes. That's church. What that is is a joke. And it's an ax to the base of our faith. More than ever, we need the truth. Amen. And more than ever in our community, we need a church that will stand on the truth. So nobody's here to praise you. We're all here to praise Jesus. But thank you for being faithful followers of Christ.
in doing what his word says to do. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord God, we need truth more than ever. We need you more than ever. Father, we need a... It's not, not just here, Lord, just the, the whole church, your body, your bride. We need a reformation, Lord. We need a reformation. We need, to, we need your help. We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit more than ever. To reform who we are back to what you have ordained in your word. It's so true that heaven and earth, even, not just people, but even heaven and earth will fade away, but your word will stand forever. And we need to follow your word if we want all things to work out for the good. Heaven help us for picking out pieces and I like this and I don't like that and you don't need to necessarily do this or that and we are lowering the bar and telling people that it's okay and I, can, I am so scared, honestly, Lord, that people are not even saved because they don't really know who you are. So, Lord, I want to pray for our churches nationwide. And then for us. But Father, I, I am only one voice, but I know that I'm echoing the voice of everyone in this room. As we come together as one voice and ask you to help the leaders of the churches reform their church back to what your word says. Give them a holy boldness that casts away all fear. Help us to be like the Christians of old who thought not of their own well-being, but thought of your kingdom and the well-being of the souls of the people who were sick, who went out and, 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 and fearlessly ministered to their spiritual and physical needs. And in so doing, it helped. And no doubt people came to you so much so that it became... The Christianity became the, the official religion of the Roman Empire that had killed you, Lord. Help us to be like that. And help us to also be fearless in that if we do that, if we swing these doors wide open and invite the sick, we may perish. So to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And even if we die, we live. Help these truths bury down into the core of our heart and let that dictate how we live. Not some disease, not cultural pressure, not government authority. The truth as it is stated in your word. Lord, I ask for your blessing on this church. We are we have tried and endeavored to, to, to stay faithful to your word the best way that we know how. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would divinely protect all who have come into this house from any sickness and disease, not just to bless them, Lord, but to bless you, that we might have a testimony that you have given us we might testify to the world that when, when the people of God obey the word of God, the author protects and provides. That's what we want. Help us to do that. Now, Lord, as we turn our attention toward kingdom giving, toward advancing this kingdom, that's what we're here for. That's what our giving is for.